let's um, oh well, let's talk about reliability. The opposite side of that. If you want to do reliability engineering, you want to make a system reliable. In other words, not fail. You want to diminish this risk probability. There's a number of things you can do. They involve redundancy. You can design redundant systems to make sure the thing doesn't fail. You can um, you can select very high grade components. You know, my, I started my engineering career in aerospace and space flight, and we used to design. I designed a moving mechanical assembly once for a weather satellite system. And you can't believe the reliability engineering you have to do. You can't send people out to space to repair your satellite, you know. It has to work for the entire mission life. So you do all these calculations on, on uh, in my case it was the ball bearing assembly had a lubricant in it and I was making sure that the lubricant wouldn't escape prematurely and cause premature failure of the bearings and the loss of the spacecraft. These are multi-million dollar projects. No possible way to repair them. You have to design for high reliability. So we would go to extensive means to do calculations to make sure the systems are reliable. This is what you do. And then in the electronic side of the satellites, you know that all these satellite systems are controlled by electronic circuitry, just like your computer, just you know, circuitry all around. You've all got something with a circuit in it in your pocket right now, I'm sure. That's pretty low-level reliability circuitry, by the way, because that's better if those fail, because you go get another one. But in a lot of cases, especially in spaceflight, you do very high reliability circuit. And the way you build a high reliability electronic circuit is you select components that have been graded as being the best available quality. You use, you know, mil-spec components and high-level aerospace aircraft spec components. And then you have them soldered together by guys who have advanced degrees and certifications, and you inspect, and there's a quality control. So you can design an electronic circuit not to fail, but you have to think about it, and you have to expend some effort to do that. So when you have a critical system, there's all kinds of ways to make sure that system doesn't fail. There's another one that's really beautiful in design, which is um, inherent safety. If you design an inherently safety, safe system, an inherently safe system is a system that when it fails, nobody gets hurt. You know, or it, it's less likely to fail because there's some quality of it that's inherently <coughs> safe. So with the thought of inherent safety, let's talk about the Buckman diversion. <laughs> okay. We're going to switch gears here. And I gave a talk on the Buckman, which a number of you were at, but I'm going to recount some of what happened. But the, fir the first thing I want to consider about the Buckman diversion is of all the places you could get your water in Santa Fe, and there's not a lot in Santa Fe. I mean, there are many, many places to get water, I suppose, in a lot of areas, but Santa Fe is somewhat limited. We have the reservoirs, we have the wells, and now we have the river. And those are kind of the big water sources around here. Is it inherently safe to take water from underneath a site that has 2,100 known toxic dump sites? You know, 60 high-level High, high concern toxic dump sites in a canyon that flows directly into the river, directly above where we're taking water. You've got to understand, you, does anybody disagree that that's an inherently unsafe thing to do? No. Nobody here? I, that's why I was wishing some officials were here. But. I have questions about the micro gram quantity of the runoff. You know, they, yeah. the, science, the PhD scientists of course they lie. Let's not drill down that deep yet. I'm, let's, let's address it in the question second. It, it's, it's a very good question. All kinds of questions. On, is this is a high-level question. Yes. You haven't discriminated between those dump sites being active or closed. Oh. That's yes, a, some dump sites may be closed. Maybe there are only 2,000 of them that are currently You talked about the 60 in that canyon. I don't think, I'm not aware of any of them being active. Oh, okay. Well, let's just put it this way. For many, many years... 67 years or so now, there is a legacy of toxic dumping and known toxic dumping up there. And now some, many of those toxins, the perchlorates, the PCBs, the radionuclides, I don't want to split hairs on this. For 60-some years, a number of toxins have shown up in a variety of places around the well, including in the river, in the sediments, in the wells, surface water. So it's, I'm just going to impress upon you at this point that it's inherently unsafe to take your water. It's not an inherently safe thing to do. Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily you're under risk. Because, as I say, you could design systems around an inherently unsafe situation, and you might go to a lot of trouble to design those systems, such that 
you're protected. And I think the question for today is going to be, did, did that happen? And did some of that happen? So let me briefly go over my story surrounding Buckman that, again, a bunch of you know, so I'll go over this fairly quickly. Um, in November of 2010, the New Mexican published a story, a really short story, in fact. It's just this top part. This is my response letter up here, but st Buckman's study says no risk from lab. It just released independent peer review, says radioactive materials uh, related to lanol activities present no health risk to a Rio Grande diversion project. And what happened with this study, I hadn't read the study when I saw this, this story, but I know enough about risk and risk analysis and probability calculation to know that there's no such thing as not, no risk, especially in an inherently unsafe when you're doing something that's inherently unsafe. The risk is never zero. And basically I wrote a very simple letter, this little letter to the New Mexican, and basically saying have we lost our ability to grasp the concept of risk. And I signed my name Mark Sardella PE, and the initials PE stand for professional engineer, and to my shock and horror at first actually, because I didn't know why they were calling me, my engineering licensure board called me on the phone. And this fellow on the other end of the phone said, I'm with the legal law enforcement compliance division. And he said, um, do you feel that the analysis of a public water system, the risk analysis on a public water system, is something that should require engineering licensure? And I said, well, the water system serves over 100,000 people. I would think you would want a licensed engineer doing the risk analysis on that. There's a, it turns out there's a number of scientific disciplines necessary, but engineering is clearly, clearly one of them. And he said, well... Do you feel that something that was done in this risk analysis report was substandard? And I said, well, to be honest, I haven't read the report, but the conclusion would demonstrate to me a lack of rig engineering rigor. I mean, how could you possibly say that there's no risk? And he said, well, first of all, I don't find anyone on the engineering roles at this company that was hired to do the risk analysis. And second of all, if you feel that the engineering is substandard and could put the community at risk, do you remember signing that code of ethics when we gave you your license? And I said, would you send me over that complaint form? I'd be glad to fill that out. And I did. So all of this started pretty innocuously. I was just pointing out that there's no such thing as no risk. And then what ended up happening was I reported this, this substandard engineering to the engineering licensure board. They sat on my complaint for nine months. After nine months, they came back to me and they said, Mr. Sardella was mistaken. There's actually no engineering in that report. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, well, you know, to, to, the first thing in my mind was, well, then where the hell's the engineering, you know? So I got curious, and I downloaded the report. It's 374 pages, and I read it cover to cover. Boy, there is no engineering in that report. In fact, and then, you know, more recently, I went through um, Joni Aaron's uh, information. She's been following Buckman for way longer than I have. Where is Joni? Thank you, Joni. <laughs> I think we should pass the basket again when we're done. Anyway, Joni's been on this for a long time, and I went, I went through Joni's files looking at the request for proposals that led to the hiring of this company to do this risk analysis. And um, it turns out they weren't actually asking for a new risk analysis to be done. What they asked for was a synthesis of all the old risk analysis that had been done and a communications plan to, co to communicate the actual risk provided by the Buckman Direct Diversion to the community. In other words, just look at the risk analyses that have already been done and, you know, synthesize those and provide that to the community and hold a series of meetings. You know, and I'll say this with some, with some candor, basically to convince the community that everything's okay, when in fact it might not be. That's my opinion of what that analysis was, was to do. So let's talk about how you would do a risk analysis on the Buckman Direct Diversion if you actually wanted to do one now.